Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Hello and welcome everybody. Today we have a Saturday, August 17, 2019 and we are going to do another reading and discussion of this little book called The Divine Program of the World's History. And I'm joined here with Michael in Germany and Jörg in Belgium. So grateful to have both of you today. Wonderful to have you, but I'm going to leave Michael to do the first greetings here. Oh, hello, Brett. Thank you for inviting me as always, and I'm very glad that I could have another discussion with you gentlemen so that i think that in the near future i will um, join you a little bit more often because you know of my personal difficulties at the moment but nevertheless i'm just keen on looking for some truth here and i think that i am on the so-called american version of hour of the truth it's correct brett isn't it <laughs> yeah, it's very correct Jörg and Michael. we're just so looking forward to Getting closer to finishing this profound book, and right now we're dealing with a very difficult topic, uh, and it's not just difficult for us, it's difficult for this whole world because we're living in a creation that was never meant to be, uh, what can we say, life is short. You know, we don't live forever now, do we? Thank God we don't live forever. 
Yeah, we definitely. have an expiration at date. <laughs> at least not here. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, for the moment, we live in a creation that was not created for us this way. Mm -hmm. It was created a much better way, but mankind has thrown it away, and now we live here, and um, we just have to make the best out of it as long as we live in the flesh. And the best that we can make out of it living in the flesh is uh, living in the spirit. And uh, how can you live in the spirit even though you are still in the flesh? Very easy. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, live according to his rules, and then you are living in the spirit because your deeds will be the deeds of the spirit and not the deeds of the flesh anymore. Of course, you will never stop sinning as long as you are in the flesh. Don't get me wrong. But your life is led through the Holy Spirit and that's why you are living in the Spirit. But you cannot live in the Spirit in this world when you are connected to the world. And therefore you have to cut all connections to the world as good as possible as you can do. Because, of course, we all still have to survive. Michael still has to do his job to earn his money. Brett still has to do his job to earn his money and I also have to do my job to earn my money and you got to do that too. But except from that, we don't have to be in the world with nothing we do, with nothing we say, no entertainment, no enjoyable poker gaming or sport events or political activity that only serves the Antichrist, nothing of the sort. We have to spend the rest of our time to glorify the Lord who created us. And that is living in the spirit, even though we are still caught in the flesh, in this damnable Antichrist system. And to unveil this Antichrist system to everyone, many people have written many interesting books. Among them, Albert Close, whose book, The Divine Program of the World's History, is a, let's call it, uh, a little putting together of what other writers before him wrote, putting it all together, putting it all in line, and giving us the information of what is the divine program of the world's history that we live in. And we are still coming, or we, not, not still, but slowly coming to an end of the book. Today we are going to continue on page 220 in the book, and seeing that the book only has, I don't know how many pages, but in PDF it's 154 from 168, only 14 pages to go, you see that we are coming to the end, and now we are speaking of the Balkan, yeah? the Balkan countries, that is those countries that you are probably know under the name like Yugoslavia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Herze uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. All in that region, we were speaking last time about the Concordat that the Roman Catholic Church made with the Servian people. The Servian, I told you, are what we call today Serbs. Yeah? And then you have this little sentence that I put in green color, that it may stand out from all the other text. This is where we're going to continue, because this is where we left off last time. It says... The infamous document, speaking of that concordat, aroused all the patriotic jealousy of the Serbian people. Why? Because the government did something the people they have to rule did not agree with. Not everybody was asked. <laughs> Isn't that always the case? Yeah? They tell us the people have the rule, but the people don't rule anything. They go to the valleys and they put their vote in a little urn and that's when it's dead. It has no meaning anymore. And this was the same year in that time. So the people felt that they had been betrayed by their own government. That's what American people should feel like. Wake up, America. Wake up, Europe. It's the same today as yesterday. Oh, no, that was Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever, right? But it's the same here in this world. We are always being betrayed by our own governments. And that the whole transaction of this concorded signing was part of a scheme to bring Serbia under the heel of Roman Catholic Austria, the Habsburgs, who have been ruling for a thousand years with the iron rod of Rome, Catholic Rome, in that region. Now on June 28, 1914, just four days after the signing of the Concordat, 
he fell at the hands of an assassin. Yeah? We are speaking of the successor to the throne. The victim of his own ambition and the just resentment of a threatened people. So first they make the concordat and now the heir of the throne can be assassinated. We don't need him anymore. Here, therefore, we see the hand of Rome fomenting this great war. Speaking of the First World War. Here, Therefore, we have the great war Cardinal Manning said was coming on Europe for the purpose of restoring the Pope's temporal power. See 1874 in this calendar. Cardinal Manning may have said that this was a war for the purpose of the restoring the Pope's temporal power. And I tell you, I can confirm everything on that on the history studies that I did so far. We have to include... <coughs> Matthias Erzberger, who was fomenting a secret treaty in 1915 in London, who set the law fully rules for the restoration of the Vatican, which then culminated in the Lateran Treaty on February 11, uh, I think it was February 11, 1929, when Mussolini signed that Lateran Treaty with the Vatican and the temporal power of the Pope was restored after it was taken away in the time between 1866 and 1870 eventually. Yeah? Here we see the hand of Rome fomenting this great war because Rome wanted to get back its temporal power. The wound that was afflicted, that we can read of in Revelation 13, that seems a deadly wound, had to be restored. And that's what this is all about. On Monday, August 3, 1914, two days before we and Britain knew there was to be war, 400 Jesuits left Hastings for the continent. We and Britain read of the declaration of war on Wednesday morning, August 5th. How in the hell did they know beforehand? <laughs> because the Jesuits have the best um, information network all over the world they have had all through history and they still have today all the so-called um uh what's that called um like like, like cia uh, all these um services um mm -hmm. uh, how, how do how do you say that i just got loss of that word i hate it when i lose just one word um These intelligence agencies all over yeah. the world, like the Mossad and the CIA and secret the BND service. and the Secret Service and the MI5, MI6 and all these secret services, information services, all these have been founded, led and controlled by the Jesuits all through the history. So this is why they knew on beforehand. See the Daily Mail, August 4th, 1914, also Daily Chronicle. The Pope, the author continues to say, has never condemned the German atrocities in Belgium, although Belgium is a Roman Catholic country and Germany nominally a Protestant country. Why has he never condemned his so-called Protestant this so-called Protestant country? <laughs> Because the Emperor of Germany was in league with the Jesuits to bring about the downfall of Britain. Because the Emperor of Germany, during and before the First World War, was told by Pope Leo XIII in the, in the 18, 1880s, late 1880s, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that Germany needs to become the sword of the Roman Catholic Church in Europe. And that's why they didn't care about the atrocities the Belgians did in Congo killing at least five million inhabitants there. Black people, you know, because black people ain't worth anything for these Belgian monsters. Huh? That's why he has never condemned this so-called protestant country. Because the emperor of Germany was in league with the Jesuits to bring about the downfall of Britain. And the British government claimed that because of the intrigues of the Austrian and German Jesuits at the Vatican, they were compelled to send their Henry Howard to the papal court as British envoy to checkmate their evil designs. Now, this statement was made by the Foreign Secretary on the floor of the House of Commons. 
Sir Edward Grace, Sir Edward Grace, late private secretary, Sir William George Tyrrell, was a Roman Catholic. And when he resigned in 1915, another Roman Catholic, the Honorable James Eric Drummond, was appointed in his place. He is brother-in-law of the Duke of Norfolk. Sir Edward Gray's assistant private secretary, Mr. Cecil F.J. Dormer, is also a Roman Catholic. I think you see some resemblance when you read about this, how Roman Catholics infiltrate here the upper and lower house of parliament in England, you see a resemblance to chapter 1 of Rulers of Evil, right? And if you don't, well, then you really have to read that book, Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy. At least read the first chapter. When you dismiss anything that is standing in the first chapter, dismissing after doing your own research, then good, throw the book away. I don't care. But read that first chapter. Oh, I can promise you, your eyes will be opened. Think of it. Think of it that all Britain's state's secrets at the Foreign Office pass through the hands of men who must divulge them to the priest in the confessional if he demands them. They in turn can pass them on to the Vatican as papal agents did in Elizabeth's time. Mr. Gladstone once claimed that state secrets, he believed, had leaked out through the confessional. Will Britain ever learn <laughs> really, I, I mean, the author is devastated. Will Britain never ever learn that Rome never ever changes her character, although she does change her manner? Ah, oh, she is a lamb in adversity, a fox when in equality, and a tiger when in the ascendancy. Now, this is a sentence you must write behind your ears. This is so important. The Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, is a lamp in adversity, a fox when in equality, and a tiger when in ascendancy. Or a dragon. Are we to lose so cheaply what our forefathers so dearly won? <sighs> no. I show how Rome has treated the Bible in Europe. In England, where Roman Catholics can purchase Bibles on every hand in spite of her, she prints Bibles, but colporteurs, means col uh, collaborants, who travel the land from end to end seldom see one. Rome prints them, not to circulate amongst her people, but to refute the charge that she withholds the Bible. She had printed Bibles before the Reformation. But she did not circulate them. Outside St. Peter's and Rome, the stores are crammed with crosses, crucifixes, images, relics, pictures of saints, etc., etc. But nowhere, nowhere can a Bible be found. So, sorry, that was number one. Yeah? Are we to lose so cheaply what our forefathers so dearly won? explanations of the diagrams and illustrations. So, number one was what I just read, this is number two. Sorry, I didn't have time to prepare this, so sometimes here and there I probably mix up the text a bit. Number two illustrates the Jesuits' conspiracy to mix and confuse the teaching of the Protestant ministry, because you have to know there are some, uh, let me see, some pictures following here, you see, these ones, and this is what we are speaking about now. So, we are really at the end of the book almost here. Let's just go back <clears throat> where we left off. So number two illustrates the Jesuits' conspiracy to mix and confuse the teaching, teaching of the Protestant ministry. Number three, so this is design or picture number three, shows the long line of great reformers and Christian leaders who have faithfully applied the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation to the papal and Mohammedan apostasies. They refused to heed the Jesuit futurist and preterist counter-interpretations. The faces, of course, are only figurative, means no resemblance of real historical figures. Number four illustrates the position of the Christian ministry today. The Jesuits have succeeded in mixing them up so badly that nearly the whole of them avoid the subject of prophecy entirely. 
As for the theological professors, the Jesuits have drawn their fire away from the great Antichrist and enticed them to concentrate it on two mythical Antichrists of Jesuit creation. The one being the preterist creation from Alcazar and the other one being the futurist creation of uh, Rivera. Uh, Ribera, sorry, <laughs> I have to use the right name here. <laughs> in the Boer War, means the Farmer's War in South Africa, the Boers, which is the farmers, Boer is a Flemish, a Dutch word for farmer, the farmers placed riflemen firing black powder on the hilltops. At the foot of the hills they placed their sharpshooters firing smokeless powder. The British artillery furiously shelled the hilltops, thinking the enemy stronghold was where the smoke puffs were seen. It was long before the ruse was discovered. In the meantime, thousands of rounds had been fired high over the heads of the sharpshooters concealed in the real stronghold. So the Jesuits have enticed our theological professors and the Plymouth brethren to fire high over the head of the great Antichrist at their two mythical Antichrists, one in the past, the Preterist, the other in the future, the future Antichrist. Between these two schools, the whole Christian ministry has been mixed up and are practically sitting on the fence. Few ministers now preach from Daniel or the Revelation. The faces are only figurative of this design. Now, the point that the author wants to make here, or that I want to make with the sentence of the author here, is few ministers now preach from Daniel or the Revelation. Especially few ministers preach from Daniel. And I'm speaking, of course, of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27 is the most misunderstood, mistaught, misread part of the Bible that lays the foundation for a future quote-unquote tribulation, for a future quote-unquote antichrist that will come at the end of the time and fulfill things where Daniel chapter 9 never ever spoke of. Daniel chapter 9, and especially verses 24 through 27, is the complete and utter fulfillment of Jesus Christ's ministry here on earth that was taking place for three and a half times, three and a half years, sorry, in the flesh and three and a half years in the spirit. The first three and a half years was his ministry in the flesh when he was teaching the kingdom of God all over the world with his disciples. Then he went to the cross to shed his blood for our sins. Yeah? He died for us, not for himself. He died for all the people that lived before him, all the people in the time that were on the earth during his lifetime, and all the future people after him. He died for all of mankind. And with that, he sealed up the vision, he made an end to sacrifice because when the time when Jesus Christ gave up the ghost, the veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom, from top to bottom, from the top down, and the holiest of holies in the temple was exposed, and God did not more dwell in temples made out of stone. When Jesus Christ then was buried and resurrected three days later and came back to life and became the first fruit of the resurrection, he was seen by hundreds of people. He visited his, his disciples who became his apostles. And when he went up into heaven, he said that he needs to go because if he didn't go, he couldn't send the comforter who would lead us into all truth. And when that Comforter in the form of the Holy Spirit came among the Apostles, in the book of Acts, I think it is in chapter 2, 1 or 2, read it for yourself. When the Holy Ghost came upon the Apostle at that moment, Jesus Christ's ministry was then continued in the Spirit. Until three and a half years later, and I think that is a point, if I'm not mistaken, you guys can help me there, I think that is in chapter 17 verse 46 or something, 
that we read from that time on, three and a half years after the crucifixion, after Jesus Christ in the flesh went to heaven, because no man went into heaven except for him who came from heaven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's only Jesus Christ who is there. Now, I lost my train of thought in the sentence that I was just forming. So, these three and a half years between Jesus' ascendance to heaven and the gospel going to the Gentiles is the fulfilling of the second part of the 70th week of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. It is completely fulfilled. There is no future Antichrist to be understood out of these verses. And there is no future 70th week of Daniel. There is no quote-unquote Jacob's time of trouble in the future, or whatever they're going to tell you. There is no seven-year tribulation. Oh yeah, there will be tribulation. Don't get me wrong. There will be much tribulation because Jesus Christ said, whoever professes my name before men will have trouble. Oh, tribulation. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And there will come a mass culling of mankind in the future. I'm sure about it. I'm sure that there will be hundreds of millions be left dead in this world. But that is not a quote-unquote seven-year tribulation with a whether pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation or post-tribulation rapture because the rapture is the damnable invention of the Antichrist. There is no rapture. There is only a resurrection when Jesus Christ comes back. And all the time in between, we, Bible-believing Christians, have to go through the tribulation because, you know, the tribulation is a time of testing. When you think you have it hard in the world that you're living right now, oh, think again. <laughs> think again. It will come a hundred times harder than you can even imagine. And why shouldn't it? Hundreds of millions of Christians went before you through that tribulation. Think of the Inquisition. Think of the Roman Caesars, how they persecuted the first Christians. Think of how the first Christians in the book of Romanism and the Reformation sent a prayer to the longevity of the Caesars to hope and pray that the Caesar would stay in office because they knew when, they, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the Caesar was disappearing, the Antichrist would come. When the Antichrist came in the form of the papacy and he persecuted the Christians like Christians and Jews had never been persecuted in the history of mankind before. All for the last 2,000 years. And you think you're going to get there clean and not a hair harmed on your body? <laughs> when you profess Jesus Christ in this world? <laughs> no. no, that's not going to happen. And if it happens, you're not a true Christian. I can give you that. But let's end my rant and rant, <laughs> and let's continue the reading. I just want to give you the last advice for few ministers now preach from Daniel, as the author says here. Please have a look at the video, The Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden, that you can find on my channel. I don't know if you can find that on Brett's channel. I think he has uploaded it there too. Is that right, Brett? That's correct. That's correct. And in the description box of that video, there are two other videos that you absolutely must watch. One is the second part of The Greatest Deception in the Garden of Eden that is titled Satan's Paradise, The Consequences of Not Understanding The Greatest Deception in the Garden of Eden. And the other one is the 70th week prophecy fulfilled uh, by Daniel. That is a video that Keith Kampschafer made a few years ago, I think 2015, if I'm not mistaken. It is also about two hours long, and it is a most wonderful video to understand the complete and utter fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Now, when the author here relies to, uh, to, to Daniel and that only few ministers now preach Daniel, he is not speaking of Daniel chapter 9, I can give you that. Because chapter 9 is by most people completely overlooked. 
Nobody talks about it. They always talk about the future fulfillment of a seventh year's week, but they never tell you where they get that from. Well, that's Daniel chapter 9. They call Isaiah 53 the forgotten chapter. I tell you, Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 is not the forgotten chapter. No, it is the forbidden chapter. And there's even a Talmudic curse on that chapter. On anyone who will, whose hands whose flesh from the hands will rot away when they turn the pages of the book of Daniel, especially chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, to understand how Daniel, um, in that chapter, predicted almost to the day the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, and there were a few people who knew when Jesus Christ was coming, and I'm not speaking about the three wise men coming out of the east because they had a star leading them to Bethlehem where the child was born. No, I'm speaking of, um, what's this guy's name, who, who stood on the, on the stairs of the temple. Um, help me out here. Oh. <coughs> He is hmm. he is mentioned in the Gospel of uh, of Luke, if uh, I'm not mistaken. C C Simeon or Simeon. Simeon, yeah, thank you. Simeon. Yeah, I, I knew it wasn't Simon. It's, it's Simeon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Yeah. yeah, it is Simeon. Simeon awaited Mary and Joseph when they took the little child in the eighth day of his earthly life to the temple for circumcision, and he held the baby up, and he knew that that was his salvation, that God had sent his only begotten son to die for us. And now Simeon could rest. Now, how did Simeon know that? Very simple answer. Simeon lived in the world, but he lived in the Spirit. So the Spirit told him. The Spirit led him into all truth. And that's what can happen to you if you study diligently the Word of God. If you study diligently the real history and you measure, measure the real history on the Word of God as He predicted it and all of a sudden you can see your eyes will be opened. Okay? Now, do you guys have anything to add to what I just said or shall I just continue in the reading? Just continue, please. If, unless Michael's got some. No, I haven't. So the faces, of course, in design number four, or the, the, the drawing number four, are only figurative. Now, number five shows the dates when the various pagan doctrines, rites and ceremonies, heresies, counterfeits and travesties of divine truth crept into the Christian church. This diagram depicts the attitude of the various schools of thought taught the old revealed interpretations and the new rationalist travesties. Design number six illustrates the disastrous effects of Eichhorn, the Germans' rationalism and revived Jesuit preterism on the Christian ministry of the 19th and 20th centuries. It is remarkable that so many of these apostasies and anti-Christian movements rose within a few years of each other. It is remarkable, but it is no coincidence. It's planned to deceive the whole world. Eichhorn's and Maitland's attempts to change the interpretation of prophecy were made in 1791 and 1826 respectively, so 35 years apart. The High Church movement to Romanize the Church of England in A.D. 1833, you know, that is the Oxford movement we speak about here. But to understand the High Church movement, we have to understand that the Anglican Church always has been Roman Catholic on the top. It was a Roman Catholic Church until the day of the rebellion of Henry VIII, who made himself head of the Church in England, but the people in the church didn't change from one day to the other to Protestantism. No, 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 no. Outward it was a Protestant church, but inwardly the Anglican church, always and surely on the top, which is here proved by the high church movement, always was a Roman Catholic church. Socialism in A.D. 1834 through 1848 as the devil's counterfeit of the social reform movement. Politics and socialism preached in pulpits instead of the gospel. <laughs> that dates from about 1848. 
secularizing the gospel, I call that. After about 1848, the German rationalist professors began to flood the world with their invented interpretations of the scriptures. Now, these interpretations were adopted wholesale by the British and American quote-unquote professors with disastrous consequences to the young ministry trained on such travesties. Rationalism has supplanted revelation. This is the age when everything must be up to date. Musical editors, in their eagerness to change something in our modern hymn books, have discarded some of the glorious old tunes for modern up-to-date airs and in many instances destroyed the soul of the hymn. Well, I think this is a subject that Michael can expound on for a few hours. Some old airs, because of the power, seem to have been inspired. The same principles have been applied in interpreting the scriptures. Men must invent some new interpretation of the atonement of Christ, his resurrection, ascension, second coming, judgment, heaven, hell, and other great truths. And they have invented them, and the result is the awful confusion and the awful unbelief of today, beginning of the 20th century and still today in the beginning of the 21st century. And the result is the awful confusion of unbelief ever since. The Holy Spirit never sent men in the Reformation age to teach one interpretation and our modern teachers to teach another. Multitudes listened to the reformers and their successors. The multitudes today, on the other hand, never go near the house of God because they do not believe the man of God is at all sure of his own message. Now this is the reason given to the author by men of all classes during twelve years of wide travel and it seems too terribly true. Men to love to hear a minister who has a message from God, from the God of heaven. Amen. We just have to look for these men. Now we come to the appendix. Roman Catholic Christians and Jesuit hypocrites. <laughs> That's a way you can split the world in two, right? Roman Catholic Christians and Jesuit hypocrites, I don't even see a difference between those two. Because Roman Catholic Christians are also hypocrites, because Roman Catholics are not Christians. But let's see what the author has to say here. The author believes and unhesitatingly acknowledges that many Roman Catholics are real children of God. Oh yeah, I agree, there are many people within the Roman Catholic Church the lay people the in, 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 sitting in the pulpit that are real children of God. Absolutely. Because God has his children everywhere, in every congregation, in every church around the world. That's true. But Roman Catholic Christians do not exist. There are Roman Catholics who are betrayed and that's why they are there. And they will become Christians when they get out of the Roman Catholic Church. They are are no Roman Catholic Christians. They have believed on Christ in spite of all the mystic pagan rites, ceremonies and doctrines under which the priesthood has buried the truth. They are better than their creed. Millions of them are in heaven today. Some, like Bernard of Clairvaux, who wrote that glorious hymn, Jesus, Thou Joy of Loving Hearts, have been God's choicest spirits. And I do not agree with the author, but do your own research on Bernard of Clairvaux, and I tell you, this guy is surely not in heaven. Anyway, I'm no judge of this, I'm just giving you the idea to do your own research. But the papal religious system, which has imprisoned the truth and unrighteousness, is the devil's travesty of divine truth. God does care whether men worship in a right or in a wrong and forbidden way. Why? Because God already tells us in Exodus chapter 20 verse 4 and forthcoming that he is a jealous God. When you take away of the worship that 
belongs to God and you take it away to worship idols, man-made idols of wood and stone and all the uh, and all other kind of man-made material, he tells you that he is a jealous God who will visit the people into the third and fourth generation of them that hate him, but he will show mercy on thousands of them that follow his commandments. So God does care whether men worship in right or in a wrong and forbidden way. So make sure that you worship in the right way. God's fiercest anger with old Israel was aroused because Israel would persist in worshiping in a wrong and forbidden way, meaning by setting up images and bowing down before them. I rest my case. I haven't read the sentence before. As regards the Roman priesthood, the author does not believe that the hundreds of thousands of bishops and priests in the Roman Catholic Church deliberately mislead and deceive their flocks. Well, the author maybe does not believe it. I believe otherwise. They are simply blind leaders of the blind. They have been trained from childhood to believe that the pagan and Babylonian rites the pagan and Babylonian ceremonies and doctrines of the Church of Rome are Christian in origin, and they believe it and teach it. Well, they should pick up a few pages of the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia and find out what their church writes over these rituals and um, images and all that stuff itself. It's mind-blowing. huh? Just open up the Roman Catholic encyclopedia and you'll find it and if you tell me that there are hundreds and thousands of bishops and priests that have never read that well that's their own fault you don't need to be betrayed you only are betrayed when you love to be betrayed when you enjoy the blessings that you get of that betrayal the blessings of this earth the treasures that you pile up here on earth instead of treasures that you can pile up in heaven where no rust and moth is going to get them that's what I tell you. So I have a disagreement with the author here. I don't know about my fellow fellow brothers with me doing this reading, but this is my understanding of it. And I don't go away from it, because the path is narrow that leads to the truth that leads to Jesus Christ, and broad is the way that leads into um, destruction. Yeah, And this is the path that they have chosen, because of materialistic gain. As for the Jesuits, the author continues, they are in a different category altogether. I give them that too. Their writings on historical questions which affect the Church of Rome show that they are hypocrites, hypocrites of the blackest dye. Their accounts of the Armada and the massacre of St. Bartholomew in the face of state documents demonstrate that their consciences are seared as with a hot iron. They are past any feeling. As for the English Jesuit preachers, their favorite theme is not the gospel of Christ, but the sexual sins of smart society. How they do love to preach about those sins. Count Hunsbruck, uh, that's a very interesting person, uh, in his book, 14 Years of Jesuits, yeah, a Jesuit, yeah, that's a monumental German work that I have on my computer. And I still don't know how to, how to read his name. Normally, O-E is pronounced E, like, you know, in my name, Jörg. You can also mm. write that J-O-E-R-G, yeah, that's E, so that must be Hönsbrüch, but I think that is, I think his name is more um, Dutch-inspired, and therefore I always pronounce him Hunsbruch. I don't know why, but that's just given in, into my stomach from the very first time. Anyway, Count Hunsbruch, or Hunsbruch, a former Jesuit priest in his book, 14 Years a Jesuit, divulges many nasty secrets concerning the private lives of the English Jesuits in their communities and colleges. He almost mentions some English Jesuits by name. This book was only published about 1910 A.D., and may be consulted in the British Museum, and I can give you the download link if you want to read it. But that's for another time.
now we are going into these different designs. Yeah? Six, not comment, if comment, I'm not comment. mistaken, and as you can hear my brother Brett, before we go into this, he has something very important to share with us. <laughs> Thanks, Jörg. I really appreciate it. We just finished the book, and uh, Jörg, you were asking if, uh, you know, during the second paragraph to the end here, as regards the Roman priesthood, the author does not believe that the hundreds of thousands of bishops and priests in the Roman church deliberately mislead and deceive their flocks. Well, I just want to give a quick biblical reference to this in the sense that uh, the Bible says here, uh, let me quick look it up, you guys, just excuse me for a sec. Uh, um, how does that scripture go again now? Ah, talk about your mind failing you at the time of uh, need. Um, I'm, I know all I'm about thinking, that, brother. Yeah, I'm thinking about the scripture of those that lead into captivity shall go into captivity. Those that kill by the sword die by the sword. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of this verse that, you know, when you follow tradition as I did, and you just accept what the doctrines are as truth. And you don't question it. You're not being a Berean. You're not like in the book of Acts that we studied, you know. You're not referring to your Bible and back-checking all of the different uh, doctrine. Then you are bound to be led down this path of, of um, believing it to be true and then leading others in that same direction. And I believe that's what the scripture is telling us here, mm -hmm. is that these people really think it's the truth. They've been deceived, and they haven't come out of the Catholic Church yet. I think we can so, read to Revelation chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. As I just put here on the screen, as you, if you see it. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, speaking of the dragon, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. That's the one you were looking for, right? Yep, that's it. Yep. So, that's why uh, Revelation, uh, was it 18.4 says, come out of her, oh, yeah? Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's 18.4, yeah. yeah. Come out of her, my people, that you be not, uh, that you don't, uh, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you don't receive of her plagues because her uh, iniquity has reached heaven, something like that, yeah. I can look that up too. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, Yerk, you know, there are those that say that, uh, you know, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, we've talked in great detail about this, Yerk, in uh, futurist uh, interpretation of, of chapter 9. There will be those that will say, well, this is not a salvation issue. I dare say it is the most important salvation issue. What do you say to that, Yerk? I'm sorry, I wasn't concentrating on what you said, brother. I was looking at the text here. Um, oh, no, 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 that's just fine. But, you know, there are those that will say that, um, you know, the futurist doctrine is not a salvation issue. How can but it not be a know, salvation issue when clearly, you don't know Jesus Christ? Well, clearly we know that's false. Yeah. If you follow the futurist interpretation, you follow a different Christ. Because the yes. futurist interpretation of Antichrist also involves that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh the first time. That's the big betrayal you have there. That's yes, what people just exactly, don't see. Because when you exactly. don't accept that Jesus Christ was the complete and utter fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, you deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. 
And what does the Bible say about denying if Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? That is the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist. And that spirit of Antichrist will not enter the gates of heaven. No. No. That's right. That's why again and again and again this is so important. Therefore, I mean, don't believe me. Just go to the Ministry of Inquisition Update. Follow Tom Fresser's readings. There's no one in the world better made for explaining this deception than Tom Fress. Mm -hmm. I have in all my life never met anyone who even comes close to the way that he can explain that. It is me so neither. simple. It is so wonderful. The way that he can explain this to you, you will never ever have another question. You have to go there with an open mind. That's true. That is something that he cannot do for you. That's something that I cannot do for you. You have to be in the spirit, honestly seeking for the truth. And when then you go to Inquisition Update to Tom Fresser's sermons, oh, oh, you'll get a lesson, oh boy. A lesson you'll never forget. And you will have an understanding like never before. I cannot do it in the words of Tom Fress. Because I am not Tom Fress. I have another ministry to do. But what he yeah, did right, and yeah. he does and still will do in the future in that regard is unmatched in the world. Let me tell you that. It is unmatched. Yeah. Please, Brother Brett. Yeah, thanks, Yerk. You know, that's true. You know, what Tom has done is unmatched. And uh, yeah, we're really grateful to have his, uh, his friendship and his, his help. You know, without help, we're in trouble. You know, that's kind of the point here I'm trying to make, Yerk. You know, people are stuck in their traditions. They're stuck in their religion. And they really think it will save them. But they haven't considered what doctrine really is what being a Berean really is what our office in this life really should be our nomination not our denomination let's say it real simple it's not hard someone's going to denominate you they're going to take away your office do you want that really go ahead then lose it And you lose yeah, everything upset. along with it. No, no, I know, I, I know that, brother. I feel the same way so often. But mm -hmm. when you lose that, you will lose everything else along with it. You will lose salvation that you never had. Because when you never, when you lose your salvation, that is a sign that you never had it, that you were never chosen. Uh, maybe sounds brutal. I don't care, but that's the way it is. You know, this is the harshest thing, Yerk and Michael, that. I, I just have always kind of hated judgment in the sense that, yeah, judge not lest ye be judged. But when we judge, let's judge righteous judgment, biblically righteous, biblically Correct. aware. Yeah. That's really what it means. Let's be aware of the scriptures. Let's be reading our Bible. Let's know for sure, without any hesitation or wavering at all, unequivocally. And then it's not that hard. It's really not that hard. The problem is doing the study, making time for the study. Because many people would rather do pleasurable things. Getting entertained. It's sad, you know, uh, but that's the truth, man. Getting entertained. Meaning getting distracted. That's it. Entertainment is just a replacement for biblical joy. Yeah, who, who, reads, who reads books? Who read books anyway? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I, I think we are done with the book, right? The we only are thing done. Left The only thing left are these few uh, drawings that come at the end. And I suggest, brother, that you will put those in the um, 
outro of this video so people can have a look for themselves. We don't need to discuss them because I already read in the uh, six points before them what is shown there. So people oh, can make up their own minds. Oh, why don't the people... Why don't the people actually download the PDF and check them out themselves? I mean, I worked hard at making <laughs> this know. PDF, man. <laughs> yeah, Come that's on. True. That's true. That's the least they can do. If they can't do their own research, then pff, what's it worth? Oh, okay. What's it worth? You know, I don't know. Uh, it's a lazy society. It's, you know, and, and people just want to sit and judge you on their feelings or whatever. You know, let's see the Bible proof. Let's see the Bible proof. Let's not talk about hearsay. Let's not talk about how I was yesterday and four or five years ago. How about today? How about tomorrow? How about tomorrow? But the fact of the matter is, Yurk and Michael, people can repent and they don't have to go the same way they've gone throughout their lives you know, I'm an idiot. I've done a lot of wrong things. I'm not saying I'm righteous or anything in that sense. Well, if you're righteous, then only through the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ, not of yourselves. That's right. See, it's his righteousness that saves. That's the point. It's not ours. Well, we share it with him, yes. But that means we have to leave the false the falsehood, you know, this, this, uh, this, uh, again, I point to this scripture, those that lead into captivity. I mean, this is so simple to me now. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yep. It's, it's that Jesus said that if we are to, ah, the, the prophecy comes through the testimony of Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through uh, men or women, for that matter. It, it comes, comes through the hearing through, of the Word of God. Yes, yes. So it's a biblical journey. It's a biblical journey. We really should be on a biblical journey in the multiple books of the Bible, and there's all kinds of things that have happened in history. So, in order for us to refresh our mind and renew our spirit, we have to let go of this old flesh and all that's attached with it. It's hard. It's not easy. It's not. It's the hardest thing you'll probably ever do in your entire life. It is for me. In that sense, that your flesh doesn't want to give up on those luxuries or whatever. You know, the flesh doesn't like to leave a comfortable position. But the spirit is much more alive when you recognize how filthy the flesh is in that sense. In the spiritual sense, they're opposed to each other. The flesh cannot be a hundred percent agreement with the spirit. No, it's quite the opposite. They totally disagree with each other. It's like oil and water. They don't mix. But yet, God created us. God created all creation. It's his creation, not ours. So, it's nothing we can boast about. Except that Jesus saved us. Right, brothers? Amen to that. Yup. Uh, it's my turn now? <laughs> Absolutely, Michael. I've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just heard the sound of silence, you see. <clears throat> you just was you, you just was citing that uh, the flesh does not like to, to move at all or to change the position reminded me in, in, in an instant uh, like a couch potato I would who is sitting on the couch and uh, switching the channels from the television set which is the altar the modern altar like uh, according to Anton Chandler Lavey from the Church of Satan but you see that 
books can lead you to an intimate and very detailed information which you cannot get from the fast world of so-called information highway nowadays. And so with book reading, you can choose your own speed and you can also repeat if something is uh, quite hard to understand or has to be read in another context or you can compare it to other books and other sources and you can, as you has uh, well put out, Brett, you can make your own search and make your own things. But it's just that the book is always give, gives me the opportunity to adjust my own speed. And that's what on the information society nowadays, there is a total attack of useless information so that uh, everybody is uh, totally exhausted because they cannot comprehend and store this much information and most of it is quite useless. And so I think that books are the best way to make your own thoughts and to make any decisions because you see that also there are people like me who have a photographic memory which means I can um, back up better in my memory, my brain, if I see something then I can then if I would only hear something or I, in, on, or maybe once in the television or so. And so I'm very glad, glad and grateful that I was uh, part of the team here, although I haven't <laughs> not uh, contributed very much. But it's uh, it's better for me to see it on the television or in, on, on the monitor now um, because I can then rely to it and I have then a bit, a bit more of information left. And so that every time you listen to the radio or television, you only hear the information and it's so fast that you cannot keep up. And uh, so I think that for me, books were always my favorite medium, my favorite method of learning, because I can put it in my own speed. I can read the things I, I am interested in. And I, there is no one in front of me who is uh, telling me which page I have to read first instead of the television or in the radio where I have to follow their program. And I don't like to follow any program. I only like to follow the holy book, the word of God and the King James Bible 1611. So I can everybody advise not only to listen to the sessions here and our sessions and the sessions of my brothers, but to read the King James Bible 1611 for yourself in a usual ca or casual surrounding <clears throat> with uh, not many distractions around, to sit there calm with uh, maybe a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and then to experience the Word of God. It's just a personal thing, and I would recommend it to everybody out here. Please read your Bible. And so it's to say Maranatha from me today. Thanks, Michael. Jörg, are you ready? Well, I think I said everything that I needed to say. It is... Um, a little bit surprising to me that we've come to the end of the reading today of this wonderful book by Albert Close. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't check that we were that close to the end. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I told you it was 14 pages in the PDF, but most of these pages are now the designs that we spoke about. I can tell you it was a wonderful journey. It was a surprising journey even to come to that book because uh, we we started this by the leading of the Holy Spirit that gave Brett possession of the wonderful book from uh, James Atkin Wiley, uh, from, yeah, uh, The Great Exodus, mm -hmm. from James Atkin Wiley, right? That's correct, yes. That's the very first book, and that book led us because we wanted a deeper understanding of the ending of the 70th week of Daniel, uh, led us into a deep study of the book of Acts, that we've done in 20 or 21 videos. We went through the whole book of Acts. And uh, any time during that study, all of a sudden, Brett came up with this wonderful book because he was looking for Henry Gret Guinness, um, who has a book in the same title, The Divine Program of the World's History. And all of a sudden, he came up with Albert Close, who I've never, ever heard before, who you hardly find on the Internet any information about. And that author has written numerous books, believe it or not. This is not, this is not the only book. He has written many more. 
always very, very interesting books. And now all of a sudden we come to an end. And I have to tell you, I wasn't even prepared to finish this book today. I thought that we were going to have at least one other session. But it's all right. It's mm -hmm. all right because we are going to continue our journey now. The circle will close when we go back to the book, The Great Exodus, and pick it up there in the 16th reading. As far as I remember, we did 14 or 15 readings of that book before. We are going to yes. continue to that one, and that is something that you have to look out for. And I can tell you, Brett and I have already discussed, we have so many projects for the future. There's, for example, the book Antichrist Exposed in two volumes, uh, The Reformed and Puritan View of the Antichrist by Dr. Ronald N. Cook, which I have here in my hands, and I just started the very first uh, volume of two, and I'm just in page 46, and this is a wonderful book that we should read. And there's this wonderful book, Rome and the Bible, and there are so many other wonderful books that all expose the oh, Jesuit yes. lie of the future Antichrist, which has been... I think now, very much established by reading the book from Albert Close, that that is just a Jesuitical lie who presents us with two antichrists, so we even have the choice which one fits us better, the preterist that all is done in the past, or the future one that is all is coming in the future. Well, and when you look to the past and when you look to the future, you know what you lose sight of? The present. And mm -hmm. that is the only time that really counts, the present moment, because past things are gone and you cannot change them and future things you cannot see. Therefore, you live in this present moment and every moment in this present time that you spend on entertainment or anything else but the study and the deliverance of the word of God is a waste of time and that's what the devil tries to do with you every second of the day 24-7, 365 in a year therefore read your Bible Maranatha from whence come wars and fightings among you come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members ye lust and have not ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. 